Hello everyone, and welcome to another video by Quiet Mind Happy Heart. This video is going to be an ASMR biology lesson with some glove sounds and whispering. So please relax and let's get started. Okay, everyone, let's get started. Now, you know the rules for the class. Everyone needs to get their gloves on because we're in the lab. Are we ready? Always best to be safe and hygienic in studying biology. So let's get into the lesson. The environment of plants and animals. Lesson objectives to discover some of the factors of the environment of plants and animals. A, environment of a plant. B, environment of an animal. C, home environment of boys or girls. Our first subject, the same elements found in plants and animals as in their environment. It has been found by chemists that the plants and animals, as well as their environment, may be reduced to about 80 very simple substances known as chemical elements. For example, the air is made up largely of two elements, oxygen and nitrogen. Water, by means of an electric current, may be broken up into two elements, which are oxygen and hydrogen. The elements in water are combined to make a chemical compound. The oxygen and nitrogen of the air are not so united, but they exist as separate gases. If we were to study the chemistry of the bodies of plants and animals and of their foods, we would find them to be made up of certain chemical elements combined in various compounds. These elements are principally carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and maybe some others, but only in very, very small proportions. But the same elements present in living things might also be found in our environment. For example, water, food, air, and the soil. It is logical to believe that living things use the chemical elements in their surroundings. And in some wonderful manner, build up their own bodies from the materials found in their environment. Now, Let's look at the illustration. 
Here we have an apparatus which is for separating water by means of an electric current into the two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, everyone, are you with me in the textbook? Do we have any questions? Okay, moving on. Now, let's turn our attention to the illustration. This chart shows the percentage of chemical elements in the human body. Here we have 72.1% oxygen, 13.5% carbon, 9.1% hydrogen, 2.5% nitrogen, 1 quarter of a percent calcium, 1 seventh of a percent phosphorus, and 2 one hundredths of a percent sulfur. Now, moving on to the chemical elements involved in water. We all know that water must form part of the environment of plants and animals. It is a matter of common knowledge that pets need to drink water, and so do other animals. Everyone knows we must water a potted plant if we expect it to grow. Water is of so much importance to us that from the time of Caesar until now, we have spent enormous sums of money to bring pure water into our cities. The United States government spends millions of dollars at the present time to bring in by irrigation the water needed to support life in the western desert lands. Moving on to light as a condition of the environment. Light is another important factor of the environment. A study of the leaves on any green plant growing near a window will convince a person that such plants grow toward the light. Animals, on the other hand, may or may not be attracted by a light. For example, a moth. A moth will fly toward a flame. An earthworm will move away from the light. And some animals prefer a moderate or weak intensity of light and live only in shady forests or jungles. Others seem to need much and strong light, and humans enjoy only moderate intensity of light and heat. Just look at the people on the shady side of a busy city street on a hot day, and you can prove this statement. So, any questions so far? OK, 
Okay then. Moving on. In this illustration, we see the effect of water upon the growth of trees. These trees were all planted at the same time in soil that is sandy and uniform. They are watered by a small spring that runs from left to right and most of the water soaks into the ground before reaching the last of the trees. And the next illustration, here we can see the effect of light upon a growing plant. Okay, moving on now to the topic of heat and plants. Animals and plants are both affected by the heat or the absence of it. In cold weather, green plants either die or their life activities are suspended and the plant becomes dormant. Likewise, Small animals, such as insects, might be harmed by the cold, or they may hibernate under stones or boards. Their life activities are stilled until the coming of the warm weather. Bears and other large animals often go to sleep during the winter and awake thin and active at the approach of the warm weather. Animals or plants that are used to certain temperatures are harmed or even killed if removed from these temperatures. Moving on to the environment and how it determines the kind of animals and plants within it. Certain luxurious growths of trees and climbing plants are characteristics of the tropics with their moist warm climate. No one would expect to find living there the hardy, stunted plants of the Arctic region. Nor would we expect to find the same kinds of animal life in warm regions as in cold. The surroundings determine the kind of living things there. Animals and plants fit to live in a given locality will probably be found there if they have had an opportunity to reach that locality. Sheep with long wool fit to live in England, for example, when we move to Cuba, where conditions of greater heat exist, would soon suffer because they are not fit or, in other words, able to adapt, to live in their changed environment. Any questions? Okay, well, let's go on. Please notice the next illustration. Here we have plant life in a moist,
tropical forest. Notice the air plants to the left and the resurrection tree ferns on the trunk. Let's talk now about plant adaptations. Plants and animals are not only fit to live under certain conditions, but each part of the body may be fit to do certain work. Each part of a plant or animal is usually fit to live for some particular purpose. The root of a green plant, for example, is fit to take in water by having tiny absorbing organs growing within it. The stems have pipes or tubes to convey liquids up and down and are strong enough to support the leafy part of the plant. Each part of a plant does work and is fit by means of certain structures to do that work. It is because of these adaptations that living things are able to do their work within their particular environment. Okay, moving on. Question for the group. Turn to your textbooks and note the illustration. A natural barrier here on a stream. Now, we would not find any trout on the top of the waterfall. Why is that? Good answer, Brock. That is correct. They are not fit to live there. Going on now to changes in the environment. Most plants and animals do not change their environment. Trees, green plants of all kinds, and some animals remain fixed in one spot practically all their lives. Certain tiny plants and most animals move from place to place, either in air or in the water or on the earth. But they maintain relatively the same conditions in the environment. Birds are perhaps the most striking exception. Some birds may fly thousands of miles from their summer homes to winter in the south. And other animals too migrate from place to place, but not where there are great changes in their surroundings. Okay, moving on again. Any questions up to this point? Well, yes, that is a very good point. The same principle of adaptation would apply to many animals. That is correct. Okay, let's move on. Here we have the second part of today's biology lesson, the interrelation of plants and animals. Our objectives for today, to discover the general interrelation of green plants and animals, 
A. Plants as home for insects. B. Plants as food for insects. And C. Insects as pollinating agents. Is everyone with me? Okay, moving on. Now, in this class, we will have perhaps many field trips, weather and circumstances permitting, of course. So what is the object of a field trip? Well, on any bright, warm day in the autumn, we will find insects swarming everywhere in any vacant lot or the less cultivated parts of the city park. Grasshoppers, butterflies alighted now and then on the flowers, brightly marked hornets, bees busily working over the purple asters or goldenrod, and many other forms hidden away on the leaves or stems of plants may be seen. If we were to select for observation some particularly old tree, we would also find it uninhabited if it is decayed. Beetles would be found boring in through its bark and wood. And everywhere, even underground, we would notice small forms of life, many of them insects. So let's talk now about how to distinguish what is an insect. Looking at the diagram, here we see an insect viewed from the side. Notice the head, thorax, and the abdomen. So, how can we tell what is an insect? A bee is a very good way and a good example of the group of animals we can call insects. If we examine the body of a bee carefully, we can notice that it has three regions like the diagram above. In other words, the head, the thorax, and the hind portion, which on insects we call the abdomen. Let's move on. Now, we must also note that an insect has wings with which it flies, but it also has legs. The three pairs of legs which are jointed and provided with tiny hooks at the end are attached to the thorax. Two pairs of delicate wings are attached to the upper or dorsal side of the thorax and the thorax, and indeed the entire body in this way, is covered with a hard shell of material, something like the horn of a cow. There is no skeleton inside the insect or muscles as we have in other creatures. If we watch carefully the abdomen of a busy bee, we notice it move up and down quite regularly. The animal is breathing through tiny holes called spiracles placed along the side of the thorax and abdomen. These also have compound eyes. Now, what do we mean by that? Let's look at the illustration here. This honeycomb pattern is an illustration of part of the eye of an insect, highly magnified, of course. Any questions this far?
what kind of forms we will look for on a field trip. Inasmuch as there are over 360,000 different species of insects, it is evident that it would be an impossible task for us to think of recognizing all of them. But what we can learn to recognize are a few examples of the common forms that we might find on our field trip. In the fields, on the grass, or on flowering plants, we may count on finding members from six groups or orders of insects. These will be known by the following characters. The order Hymenoptera, which means the membrane wing, to which bees and wasps and ants belong, is the only insect group the members of which can truly sting other creatures. Butterflies or moths will be found hovering over flowers. They belong to the order Lepidoptera, which means scale wings. Grasshoppers, which we can find almost anywhere this time of year, and also crickets, which are black, white grasshoppers, and can often be found under stones, belong to the order Othoptera, which means straight wings. Members of this group may usually be distinguished by their strong jumping hind legs, and by their chewing or biting mouth parts, and by the fact that the wings are folded up and are somewhat stiffer from the front wings. Any questions? Moving on, here we have a very, very useful illustration indeed. These are the different forms of life we may find on our field trip. However, let us first continue on to the four other types of insects that we may find. Another group of insects sometimes found on flowers in the fall are flies. They belong to the order Diptera, which means two wings. They are usually rather small and have a pair of gauzy wings. Flies are very important to humanity because many of them are disease carriers. Bugs are members of the order Hemiptera, which means half wings. They have jointed proboscis joints which point backward between the front legs, and they are usually small and may or may not have wings. Type number five. The beetles or the coleoptera, which means sheath wings, are often mistaken for bugs by the uneducated but they have the first pair of hardened wings meeting a straight line in the middle of the back. Beetles are frequently found on goldenrod blossoms in the fall. And our final group, other forms of life, especially spiders, which have four 
pairs of walking legs. Four pairs, eight in total. We also have centipedes and millipedes. Both of these are worm-like and have many, many pairs of legs. Moving on now to our illustration. Here are the forms of life on a field trip. A. This is the red-legged locust, which is one of the Orthoptera. And O is the egg, which is laid. And this is about the natural size. Next, we have B, which is the honeybee, and one of the Hymenoptera species. Next, we have C, which is a bug, and one of the Hemiptera species. Next, we have D, a butterfly, an example of the Lepidoptera species. This is slightly reduced from its real size. Then, we have E, which is a housefly, the species Diptera, which here we represent as about double the natural size. Now, F is explained on this side of the textbook. This is an orb weaving spider, which is about half its natural size. Please note, this is not an insect. Note the number of legs. Finally, we have G, which is a beetle, slightly reduced in size here, which is one of the Coleoptera species. Okay, moving on. We are going to focus very briefly before we dismiss on the life and history of the butterfly, particularly the milkweed butterfly. And here we have an illustration of one of its close species, genre I should say, which is the monarch butterfly. So getting on to the milkweed butterfly. If it is possible to find on our trip some growing milkweed, we are indeed likely to find hovering near a golden brown and black butterfly which is called the milkweed butterfly. Its body, like in all insects, is composed of the three regions we have talked about before. The butterfly frequents the milkweed in order to lay its eggs there. And this it may do almost any time from June until September. The eggs are tiny hat-shaped dots which are about a twentieth of an inch in length and are fastened singly to the underside of the milkweeds. Some wonderful instinct leads the animal to deposit the eggs there. The eggs hatch in about four or five days into rapid growing caterpillars each of which will shed its skin several times before it becomes full size. After a few weeks then, the caterpillar stops eating and begins to web a tiny mat of silk upon a leaf or stem. It attaches itself to this web by the last pair of prolegs, and it hangs there in the dormant stage known as the chrysalis or pupa. 
This is a resting stage during which the body changes from a caterpillar into a butterfly. So, after about a week or more of inactivity, in the pupa state, the outer skin is split on the back and the adult butterfly emerges. At first, the wings are soft and much smaller than in the adult. Within 15 minutes to half an hour after the butterfly emerges, however, the wings become full size. Our next topic then, how do plants furnish insects with food? Food is the most important factor of any animal's environment. The insects which we have seen on our previous field trips feed on the green plants along which they live. Each insect has its own particular favorite food plant or plants, and in many cases the eggs of the insect are laid on the food plant so that the young may have food close at hand. After a field trip, no one can escape the knowledge that plants often give animals a home. The grass shelters millions of grasshoppers and countless hordes of other small insects, which can also be obtained by sweeping through the grass with an insect net. Some insects build their homes in trees or bushes on which they feed and others tunnel through the wood, making their homes there. Spiders build webs on plants and often use the leaves for shelter. Birds nest in trees, and many other wild animals use the forest as their home. So, we have discussed what plants do for animals. But what do animals do for plants? So far, it has seemed that green plants benefit animals but receive nothing in return. But we will see tomorrow that plants and animals can live together to form a balance of life on the earth and that this is necessary. Certain substances found from animals are necessary for the life of a green plant and a green planet. Turning on to the next page, if you would please. You will notice here that we will begin to discuss pollination tomorrow. Please, I would like everyone to read the remainder of chapter two for tomorrow and be prepared for a pop quiz.
us so much for your attention. joining us.